Good afternoon and welcome to the second annual Vito Ambassiani and George DeSalvo LGBTQ Health Equity Lecture. Uh, Dr. Ambassiani and his spouse George generously endowed this series, the first such at any medical school, with the goal of supporting the preparation of culturally competent physicians who can provide medical care and preventative services that are specific to the LGBTQ population, something that has long needed our attention. I know Vito and George wish they could be here today, uh, but they are busy fulfilling important roles in the health and healthcare back in California. Vito, a urologic sur surgeon, was just recently appointed as the Secretary of the California Department of Veteran Affairs by Governor Jerry Brown. Uh, and George, uh, his spouse, serves as the Chief Financial Officer of the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan rather in for Los Angeles, so rather large roles they have in providing care in that community. Today we'll hear from one of our own, Dr. Evan Eiler, a professor of psychiatry and family medicine. Evan did his graduate study at the University of Michigan, where he received an MD from the medical school and a master's degree from the School of Public Health. He has been active in transgender medical care since 1995. Prior to joining the UVM faculty in 2005, Dr. Eiler served as the director of primary care services of the University of Medicine Comprehensive Gender Services Program. He has also really been a, a contributor and made a difference in this field nationally. He's published two books in the field, Principles of Transgender Medical and Transgender Medicine and Surgery, and Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Aging, Challenges in Research, Practice, and Policy, which is really a, uh, a developing topic uh, in this field. Uh, he is also a very compassionate and caring physician. Uh, and his work with patients and learners has been recognized by the UVM College of Medicine's 2014 Leonard Tao Humanism and Medicine Award. Please be, join me in welcoming Dr. Iyer. Hey, can you hear me? Well, thank you. It is a privilege and a pleasure to be here. And I recognize also that this is a diverse audience. And if this is too basic and you could do better, that's terrific. Vermont is a very civic-minded place. Sign up, get an audience, I'll come to your talk. Um, on the other hand, if there's something that I'm saying that doesn't make any sense, um, then we have time to discuss afterwards. Hopefully, uh, we, can, we can do that. In talking about LGBT health, I wanted to focus specifically on older adults for several reasons. One is that I think when we're considering progress over time, it's the cohort of people who are older adults now, which I'm defining roughly as people in their 70s, 80s, 90s, 100s, although certainly there are people younger than that who have similar concerns and, and similar experiences. It's that group who made it happen it's that group who are living with the consequences in health of some of the difficulties that they encountered. And I also think that disproportionately, that's the group that did the heavy lifting in terms of achieving the measure of equality that LGBTI-identified people now have, although in many cases they've disproportionately not received the, the benefits of that. So what we're going to do tonight is to consider a few things how is the life experience of older adults who are members of sexual orientation and gender identity minorities, so basically LGBT, et cetera, people, how has life experience influenced their health and participation in medical and other healthcare environments? And then the next part I think of as the good, the bad, and where do we go from, from here? So by the time we're done, hopefully we'll have considered some barriers to attainment of equality in health status and healthcare some policy milestones that have been very influential in terms of what's good, how did we get where we are now, and then where can we go from here uh, to make things better. I'd like to start with a couple of short video excerpts. That's Lawrence Johnson, the poet, reflecting on his experiences and I would call attention to a few things that he said.
I might call attention to a few things that he said if I had a slide. Okay, here we go, good. All right, these are the take home points that I took from the discussion that he was just giving us. Earlier times of life absolutely were dangerous um, for most people who were in some way LGBT identified or who thought they might be in earlier times of their life. Living openly was not an option. And when he said all that gets internalized, it does. The instinct to isolation, the fear, the shame, are things that people carry with them the rest of their lives, even if things are better subsequently, and even if they make a lot of progress in dealing with that. Then the body becomes more vulnerable in old age, and it brings all of that back up again. When was the last time that you felt frightened? When was the last time that you felt vulnerable? At the same time, on the good side, he says, now I look at all these people and I see me. And that's what I always hope for in any sort of clinical interaction, is that people will be most themselves and be comfortable being themselves when they're dealing with me or with any of us. So these are the things we're going to talk about next. Who are LGBT identified people, particularly older adults? What about health disparities? Um, and what progress has been made? What are some possibilities? Um, I like the, the abbreviation SOGI, pronounced SOGI, that shows up in more and more articles. It stands for Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. I like it because it sounds so samurai. You know, have these, have these data been checked for SOGI effects? <laughs> yes, Sensei, just as you taught us. Yeah. Um, at the same time, it, it's, a, it's a good little um, sort of acronym. I, I put an asterisk next to the word queer in that this has become somewhat of an umbrella term um, for anyone whose sexual orientation or gender identity is sort of non-majority, um, but it tends to be disproportionately not used by older adults. It's just too painful for many people. So that for someone who's younger and maybe had a lesser burden of suffering, the sense is, well, why don't we reclaim that word and do something good with it? Um, an older gentleman said to me, you know, my family's Jewish, and when we start referring to ourselves with every slur ever invented for Jewish people, and when my sisters start referring to themselves with every slur, you know, or even just one of them that has been made up for women, then I'll start calling myself queer. In the meantime, I won't do that. Okay, he's earned that, you know, and I point that out because it is a generational cohort effect, um, one that I think of, 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 of many. Um, gender identity. I think it's good to have a definition right off the bat, and, and for people who uh, were here when we talked about this the other day, um, bear with me just for a minute here, in that really gender identity refers to an internal psychological sense, a self-perception of whether one is or really should be a woman, a man, or a member of some other gender, which is different than gender role or expression, which are the things that we do to communicate to other people how we would like to be perceived. Um, this is a little graphic by a guy named Killerman that I sometimes use in talking with parents who have gender atypical or gender creative kids. And the point that he's making here is that it has been said that sex lives below the belt and that gender lives above the ears. Um, I think there's a lot of truth to that. He also symbolizes sexual orientation with a heart, which I would suggest is really just symbolic. That also would live in the brain, but we, we symbolize that collection of neurobiological functions with a heart. I guess it's nicer. And then um, he's showing the, the gender-bred person in the, in the gender ginger color um, to symbolize um, expression, living the world, uh, that sort of thing. Trans is a little different than lesbian, gay, bisexual, or other sexualities um, in that gender transition involves visible physical changes. After a while, there isn't a closet. Um, if someone was born female-bodied um, and is transitioning to male and begins getting a beard or male pattern baldness, after a while, there, there's no hiding those things, and so who one comes out to and talks to is a little bit different. Medical services are different. There are no medical services needed to be gay. Go for it. Um, gender transition, on the other hand, often involves hormonal and surgical treatments. Um, for young kids, it may involve puberty suspension, and these are usually lifelong treatments that hormones are often taken uh, through the rest of one's life. Therefore, medical services become partly hormone-based and partly organ-based. 
a transgender woman who still has a prostate may develop prostate disease. Um, at the same time, her hemoglobin will probably go into the female range after a relatively short time of having a female hormonal constellation. The burden of stigma is often greater in a healthcare setting. One of the things that I hear from, from um, people not uncommonly is, you know, well, gosh, everybody knows someone who's gay, but this is different, this is new. Um, to which I can only say, God, I wish I had a video camera and a time machine and could go back 50 years and say, you know, that's no big deal, you know, terrific, but we don't, we don't have that. Um, and often there's less social support, particularly uh, for older adults. I also want to just give the caveat that the LGBT community is often symbolized with a plus or an asterisk, represent a, di a diverse group of populations uh, that have some similarities in terms of minority status and goals, but are distinct nonetheless. Intersectionality theory re recognizes also that people can have multiple minority interactions, that identities that, that interact in unique ways. There was a wonderful book that came out in the early 80s, um, Patricia Belscott, Barbara Smith, and Gloria Hall wrote called, All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave, that was about African American women's studies, a really groundbreaking book saying, you know, this experience is different than either that of African American men or white women. We are our own distinct group. Um, sometimes this becomes extremely important in LGBT health. The identifiable demographic group in the United States that probably has the highest risk of actually being murdered is African American transgender women. Um, I think because of factors like that. So this is a complex topic. This can be a start. We can have more discussion and there can be more discussion on, on other days. So who are the older adults that we're talking about? This is a population that is diverse in terms of life experience, although with some common themes. LGBT-identified people in general are becoming more visible, both the young and the old. LGBT older adults include people who are out late, who did not have the opportunity to be out early, and are finally becoming visible and wanting to be identified and treated for who they are. Um, also includes some people who were extremely brave and, and led the way and did the groundbreaking things that we're talking about tonight. People going back into the closet because they feel too vulnerable to be identified at a time when they're not their best. A friend called me a while ago and said, I need you to come and stay with me in the hospital overnight after I have surgery. And I, I said, you know, tell me more. So this is someone who has a PhD who's very successful um, raised her child as a single mom, and she said, you know about some of the experiences that I had when I was young, and, and I do. She had told me about some of the, the traumas that she experienced, and she said, I know this is not what's going to happen, but I can't shake the feeling that when I'm back in my hospital room after surgery, and I'm still a little groggy, that someone is going to come and hurt me, and I can't defend myself. It reminds me of too many experiences that I had in the past, and I just want someone there. Will you do it? And I said, you know, of course. Um, and I hear similar situations from people from time to time in which they feel vulnerable with the physical changes of aging, unable to advocate for themselves as they once did, and become more fearful. Um, this is a group of people who lived in fear of discovery. What will happen if people know? The one gentleman in Out Late said the worst thing would be having people know that you were a fag. Must hide that. Um, people who learn to be ashamed through the feedback that they got growing up and many times um, later on to heal. Um, and some people who are seizing the opportunity to come out at long last. So a group of people who in many ways are brave, wounded, cautious, and proud. I'm going to show you one more little set of films. Different age, different era, different world, um, et cetera. But since we should flesh this out a little bit and we have the time to do it, let's go on and talk a little bit about um, history and how that is known to people currently and how it influences their lives and our lives. So a very, very brief history of uh, dates of note. Um, Bottom line, there have always been gay people. There have always, has always been gender variants, as well as we can tell. In ancient Greeks and Roman Republic times, there was a fair amount of tolerance. The Roman Empire came along, and suddenly we have sodomy laws with very huge penalties. Um, that gets translated into British common law, although interestingly, 
not in France forever. For those of you who are of French ancestry with the French Revolution, they got rid of the so-called victimless crimes, which included things like sodomy and blasphemy. Um, so it may have consequences for the individual, but not for society. That being said, um, there have always been people who have been gay, who have been trans, including in Vermont. These are silhouettes. It's the only surviving images of Sylvia Drake and Charity Bryant, who lived in a common law, same gender marriage from 1807 to 1851 in Weybridge, Vermont. And unlike many other couples where there are sort of hints, here we have diaries. We have records from the tailor shop that they ran together, and we have their gravestone, which is in Addison County. A friend of mine who's an older gay man said that he was in the area, stopped, went and found it in the cemetery, and stood there and wept. He said, there have always been gay people, but for once we have tangible evidence that that was the fact. In addition to which, their families must have respected their relationship because this would have been a sizable expense to get them a joint headstone that was made of high quality stone and durably worked so that 150 years later, um, it would still be readable and still be visible. I couldn't find similar evidence for others, but let's just say there have always been male couples, there have always been gender variant people um, in Vermont and everywhere else. Um, these are some of the other sort of dates of progress for good or bad along the road to where we are now. The Stonewall riots or, or Stonewall uprising, I guess I should say, in 1969 certainly was a galvanizing of the gay community and to a degree trans community fighting back against police. Um, and after that, a number of other important things happened. Many times progress in healthcare follows progress in civil rights, once in a while the other way around. The American Psychiatric Association dropped homosexuality as a psychiatric condition in the DSM in 1973. Um, interestingly, when it had been put in the DSM earlier, that was considered by many gay people to be an improvement because it was better to have, uh, to be unwell than morally failing. Um, but, but why be either one? Um, one of the, the little interesting side notes of history, in 1979, Sweden um, removed homosexuality as an illness from their national health organization after a day of protest in which protesters called into work gay. And if, it, if it's an illness, I shouldn't be expected to work if, if I'm ill. Um, and and I, I can imagine the employer on the other end of the phone either speechless or saying, what? You know, That's right, I'm calling in gay. Um, so apparently that was uh, successful, and um, the, it was uh, depathologized in, in Sweden. Um, nothing is all linear. The Bowers v. Hardwick was a, a disastrous Supreme Court case in which, on a split decision, it was ruled that, yes, states could enforce sodomy laws, could regulate sexuality, including between consenting adults in private, uh, which was not reversed until 2003 with another Supreme Court case. I point out to people that if your patient is over the age of 12, that they lived in an era in which, in many parts of the country, it was criminal behavior to have consensual same-gender sex in private, and in some states it could result in, in heavy prison time. Um, people know this. It's left, it's left an impact. Um, a whole lot of other very good things have happened in the last 10 years, and even really in the last five, in terms of um, changes in the VA system, changes with Medicare, changes with SAMHSA, changes with the Department of Health and Human Services, and we'll get to some of those in a minute, but what this is really about is us and them. Are people who are in some way LGBT identified part of us, um, or are they some a part of some other group that's a bad group um, that has anything to do with, with perversion, criminal behavior, um, sinners, um, et cetera. And, and I think that there has been, for many people, much of the time, certainly not every day and not in every part of the country, a lot of progress in going from being part of those other people over there to be, being part of us here. One of the things that I hear commonly from people who are in older adulthood now is that there was a time when they came to realize that 
as kids that that feared other over there, them is me, because people heard about fags and about dykes and about perverts and about all these terrible people when they were little tiny, since most people who are gay do not grow up in gay families. And then at some point in the teen years or maybe preteen would have that sudden thunderbolt of saying, oh my gosh, those terrible people over there, I'm one of them. That's one way in which, particularly for older adults, it's different growing up gay or growing up trans than growing up as a member of another minority group because gay people do not primarily grow up in gay families. So the only Jewish family in a Christian neighborhood, there may be anti-Semitism, but the family can stick together and say, this is how we deal with that. Um, it's a little bit different discovering that, that one is different from one's own family for many people. One of the fundamental principles of medical ethics is respect of persons. And one of the fundamental principles of psychiatry that's applicable in other fields of medicine is that a therapeutic relationship involves one in which we do our best to foster hope and reduce shame. And even for people who've come to a place of pride and identity now, there's that shadow of shame that says, you're not OK, you never were, you're different, you're bad. And that is one of the things that clinically we need to address. How does this manifest in, in health status rather than access difficulties? A, a little definition. This is from Healthy People 2020. Um, I gave you the website there. Although the term disparities is, it was initially designed for and still often refers appropriately to racial and ethnic disparities, any population in which there is a health outcome that occurs in a greater extent in one population and a lesser in another, it's worth looking at that as a disparity and considering what social determinants may be influencing that finding. In terms of negative health experiences and negative aspects of, of health status in the LGBT communities, why might that occur? There have been a number of things that have been described in the literature for a long time. The first one is the effect of adverse childhood experiences on subsequent health. That there, even back in the 90s, it was clear that there were a number of health outcomes having to do with substance abuse, depression, suicide, smoking, STDs, STD acquisition, physical inactivity, and severe obesity um, being some of the principles, that, that the risk of those findings in adulthood correlates with the degree of adverse experiences that the person underwent early in life. Um, everything from being a witness to domestic violence to being physically abused oneself and, and so forth. Um, disproportionately, people in the LGBT communities report difficulties when they were kids because of being the different child. The too feminine boy, the too masculine girl often gets singled out, gets picked on. Um, and that can feed into the dynamic that the adverse childhood experience um, literature addresses. Also, minority stress. Um, again, not initially described for this community, but often applicable. Um, the, an article by Meyer, I like their definition. They describe that as the experience of prejudice events, expectations of rejection. And if you've had a certain amount of rejection, it's, it's normal to expect more. Um, hiding and concealing, internalized homophobia, that sense of, yes, there really is something wrong with me, um, and then the coping processes that uh, people use to address that. Um, so when I think of disparities and, and potential reasons for that in these communities, I think of three things. One is sort of the substrate, early abuse leading to more, more difficulties in adulthood. Um, also difficulties through health-related policies in accessing care, um, as well as the legacy of early encounters that sometimes makes it difficult to, to receive care even when it's available. That reflex for secrecy, that reflex for isolation that many people uh, describe. So these are a few of the government documents that I think are worth looking at. Um, I didn't include very many direct statistics in this because they are lesion and they are well summarized in many of these policy documents. The Institute of Medicine did a report on LGBT health a few years ago. They stratified it. 
um, you know, pediatric, adolescent, early and middle adulthood, older adulthood. And what they found in an exhaustive review of the literature was that yes, um, lesbian, gay, and bisexually identified adults do in fact experience more mood and anxiety disorders and an elevated risk of suicide compared to heterosexually identified peers. That for people who are trans, that the sampling methods have not been as definitive, that the literature is less robust, but that as best as we can tell, very similar. Um, similarly, higher rates of smoking, higher rates, higher rates of substance abuse, um, and uh, still frequently targets of stigma, discrimination, and um, violence that is based on SOCHI status. They also particularly called attention to HIV and its, its effect disproportionately back to that intersectionality theory on people who are African American, Latino, or Latina, um, particularly trans women and men who have sex with men. Um, they also noted that preventive care is more likely to be linked to milestones that are more commonly experienced by heterosexual women than lesbian and some bisexual women, like linking preventive care to access to contraception, um, things of that nature. And on a good note, um, although lesbian and gay adults are less likely to be parents than their heterosexual peers, their kids generally do well. Um, all of the things that people who are currently older adults grew up hearing about how children would be irrevocably damaged by having two moms or two dads or, or a trans parent, I guess was probably not even discussed at that time, uh, are false. Um, they also noted that in later adulthood, one area that there is some indication and that needs fleshing out with additional research is the amount of crisis confidence and resilience that many SOGI identified older adults have. That in many cases, the whole thing about what does not kill us makes us stronger, sometimes that's true. Um, and they specifically called attention to the fact that it is very difficult in a group that lost a lot of peers to HIV when they were young now to be losing their remaining friends um, to things like heart disease and cancer. The transgender literature is not as robust. Um, one of the documents that we have that's pretty good, I think, is the National Transgender Discrimination Survey Report on Health and Health Care that came out in 2010. There was just another round of survey sampling completed, so this will come out and in, with a revision next year. Um, what they found was, yes, um, illness and disability is more common among trans people than their non-trans peers. Um, Suicidal ideation and attempts much more common than among non-trans peers, and the same types of patterns as are seen among lesbian, gay, and bisexual adults um, with regard to substance use and related problems. They also called attention to minority stress in the literature in that regard, um, and, and directly to barriers to care that of their survey respondents, 28% um, reported harassment in clinical settings, um, postponing care due to uh, fear of discrimination, um, being denied care, feeling that providers um, of care were not knowledgeable, um, as well as um, as a result of discrimination and stigma often being lower income or not having um, coverage or not having insurance coverage that covered the sorts of things that they needed as health services. The Healthy People 2020 um, document, again, um, voluminously ref, uh, referenced, very similar findings. Um, I liked a couple of the things that they pointed out. One was that experiences of violence and victimization produce long-lasting effects. Things that happen to people in their teens and 20s affect their health in their 50s and 60s and 70s. But at the same time, that can be mitigated through personal, family, and social acceptance. Um, and that basically there are things that can be done now to make things better. Um, they also flesh out specifically what is it that constitutes barriers to health at this point. Um, types of legal discrimination in health insurance, um, legal marriage, which is getting fixed, although there are same-gender marriage rights nationwide at this point, but since many states do not have employment protections based on sexual orientation and gender identity, many people cannot get married because of the very realistic possibility of being married on Sunday and fired on Monday. So even though the legal right is there, it's not yet practically applicable. Um, so that many 
heterosexual couples who can access health insurance through their spouse, um, their gay or trans peers, if they live in a state without employment protections, are not able to do that. Um, similar mirrored problems with retirement benefits, including Social Security and the VA, um, patterns of inheritance that have affected the older adults, even if there are now legal remedies, um, and also um, a lack of social programs that targeted towards the groups that need them most are some of the findings that they, they came up with. So when I think of this, I think, okay, if we look at the last 50 years or so, um, 1965 to 2015, we've come a long way. The progress hasn't been linear. In some ways, it's been sort of parabolic in recent years. And I think of that as really being kind of halfway home. You know, on the good side, LGBT identified older adults are becoming more visible in healthcare environments. And also, LGBT, LGBT health status, including for older adults, is becoming a mainstream concern. Um, in medical education, in research, in public policy, there have been a number of very good literature reviews and, and focused policy analyses in recent years. Um, the not so good news is that the suspected health disparities that people in clinical medicine for a long time thought were there um, really are. There's good documentation of that now. Um, many of the difficulties that people have when they're young um, do cause problems in later ages, and, and that can be pretty difficult to ameliorate. Um, for many older adults, um, the, that, says that should be health rather than heal. Legacy of, of stigma and discrimination is very present, um, and they're dealing with that now. Um, and also, some portions of the LGBT populations, still there's a need for a lot more robust data collection and analysis. I think that there's some potentially good news. Um, the Institute of Medicine, the Department of Health and Human Services have recommended routine data collection regarding sexual orientation and gender identity using electronic records. So we're going to have a lot more and better data within the next few years. At the same time, this is a two-edged sword for older adults who are used to being very private, who are not going to want to disclose that data, and who have the right not to disclose it if they don't want to. Um, I think it's also potentially good that there are ways to address these disparities in terms of development within the clinician workforce of attitudes, knowledge, skills, and also with more professional advocacy. So I'd like to turn attention to a moment for a moment to um, where are we in, I think, in terms of, of progress and in terms of opportunities, in terms of policies, there's been a lot of very good developments just within the last five years. The Presidential Memorandum on Hospital Visitation, which came out in 2010, um, solved in one swoop a very big problem that had been present for a long time, and that was that hospitals, health groups, specific people working in hospitals, um, whole states could set regulations regarding who could or couldn't visit a, a hospitalized person that were frankly and floridly discriminatory. One of the quotations from this report, the link to which I, I gave you toward the bottom, is all too often people are made to suffer or even pass away alone, denied the comfort and companionship in their final moments while a loved one is worrying and pacing down the hall. Um, and so, Thank you, President Obama. It's done. That is no longer a lawful thing to do. Um, anyone can visit regardless of um, relationship status, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, and no one dies alone. This may sound trivial. Um, it's certainly not. One of the sort of sentinel cases that happened right before this was issued involved a family um, two lesbian women who were married in another state and their two children vacationing in Florida. One became acutely ill and was hospitalized, and her wife and her children were not allowed to visit, 
and while they were attempting to, per, to find the documentation, you know, raise your hand if you travel with your marriage license in your car. While they were attempting to find documentation, she actually died by herself. Presidents can do things. Stroke of the pen, it's done. Um, the Joint Commission, who normally are not, is not my favorite organization, um, and not a favorite of most people who work in medicine and nursing also has issued some regulations that have been helpful. One of those came out in 2011. Hospitals must prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity or expression regardless of local law. You're a hospital, people have to be welcome. Terrific. Um, they also went further and said, hospital staff should be protected from discrimination. Transgender patients should have their preferred name, even if it's not their legal name. A lot of times it takes a while for documents to catch up with real life. And that hospitals should maintain the confidentiality of information regarding sexual orientation or gender identity or expression. They issued a whole document, pretty fat, um, called the LGBT Field Guide. And you can download it for free, and there it is. This is uh, the University of Vermont Medical Centers, you know, Exhibit A. I got these, by the way, from Dr. Gibson, who's much better at screenshots and so forth than I am. But um, this tells the story here. We have a non-discrimination policy um, for patients, for employees, um, about visitation, about care that specifically states sexual orientation, gender identity, um, all are welcome. In terms of promoting further policy progress, I th in, in sessions like this, I like to give people a little bit of homework. Um, not too much, just a little. And one suggestion that I would make would be contact one organization. You could go with the National Center for Transgender Equality. I put the website at the end, or the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, or one of the others. Um, and ask for policy updates. Most of them have a give us your email thing. If that's too much, my own email inbox is overflowing. I'm not signing up for anything. I'm trying to get stuff out of it. Um, just go to their website once a month and see if there's an update. Many times when there's a government action that is being considered, there will be a public comment period. And I think it's very powerful for people to write in and say, you know, I'm a physician at the University of Vermont Medical Center. I'm a nurse practicing in internal medicine. Um, you know, I work clinically with people um, who have these concerns. I myself am lesbian or gay or bisexual or trans. Um, and I think it's very important that this happen or that this not happen for the following reasons. You know, sometimes volume counts. That's a very simple thing that can be done um, in 10 minutes. And many organizations uh, will give you a sample. If it's an, a policy issue that you don't want to get involved in, that's okay too. Wait for the next one. Um, education. I think there's a lot of strides that are being made in this area, and my short homework suggestion would be take at least one short, self, one short, boy, that's a tongue twister, one short self-study course um, on LGBT health, or if that's too much, uh, read an online article. If you want to do it here, again, courtesy of Dr. Gibson, this is uh, the link that you can find on the UVMMC website um, under talent management, uh, that there is another e-learn course um, on LGBTQ patient-centered care, and there it is. Um, there are all kinds of other programs that people can download for free. Um, they don't give you college credit, they just give you the satisfaction of, of having a few more tools in the toolbox. I put some links there, um, people would like to use them. Um, or if you don't really like um, stuff like that, but just want to watch some good films, uh, there's a whole bunch. And I gave a couple of, of suggestions there. In terms of clinical care, my goodness, why do they call it the practice of medicine and the practice of nursing? Because it takes so darn much practice. And because we're all um, improving all the time, a, a colleague who does a lot of, of cultural competence work for one of the major psychiatric associations told me privately that she herself does not like the word cultural competence because it seems presumptuous. You know, well, now I'm competent, and before I wasn't, and I'm competent and you're not. When this is actually always a work in progress. But there are a few things that I'd like to suggest as sort of things to consider doing. Um, in clinical interactions, particularly with older adults who are LGBT identified. Um, 
I think perspective is important, particularly remaining aware of cohort effects, um, secrecy, past trauma, and inflicted identity shame. Inflicted identity shame is that sense of, oh my gosh, those bad people over there, I'm one of them, and this is part of me, and that's not fixable. There's a, a line from a Louise Penny novel that I've always remembered, being made to feel shame about something not shameful. There's, there's nothing wrong with being gay, there's nothing wrong with being trans, but it can certainly feel like it. Um, I'd suggest becoming familiar with the concerns of LGBT older adults. I put in a lot of references about that, particularly people who are just coming out now. I think that there are, are some different um, concerns and issues than some of their peers who've been out for a long time. Um, it's also, I think, useful to, to bear in mind that either staying closeted because of needing to feel safe or coming out and transitioning um, takes a tremendous amount of en energy for a lot of people and that health needs may not have been met if that just did not get to the, the top of the, the list of things to do. Um, I think also that particularly with the new changes in electronic records that we're being more and more expected to sort of ask questions as a matter of routine that for many people are not very routine. Um, there, there are generational cohort effects of, it, with regard to what's private material for everyone, and that may go double um, for people who've had to be closeted, particularly at times of increased uh, medical vulnerability. So my suggestion is, you know, gently ask, but also respect privacy. There's no requirement that people cough up a relationship history um, just because there's a box for it uh, to check. I'd also suggest avoiding gratuitous questions. One of the things that I hear particularly from people who are trans is, if I'm there for a sprained ankle, don't ask about what surgeries I've had. You know, or if there's a question about some specific aspect of care that is not germane to the visit, um, maybe ask if there's a source that one could read rather than using the patient as a source of, of information. Um, the last bullet that I put on that one, manage the health, the negative health effects of health disparities without judgment. I'm going to give an example of that. I was talking a little while ago to a colleague who's a, a trans man um, who practices elsewhere, and he said, you know, I'm going to have to get a different internist. And I said, oh, you know, what's the problem with the person that you're seeing? And he said, well, one of the, the uh, practice improvement projects that they have going is, is treatment of obesity, and I'm quite overweight. And I said, you know, um, so many of us are, tell me more. And he said, so every time I go in, the, the, the discussion is shifted by my internist to issues about weight, and I've told her that I'm really not ready to take this on at this point, what I haven't told her, because this is really hard to talk about, is that it's really hard to live in this body anyway. You know, even though I've been through transition and so forth, it, it's, you know, my body has never fit, it doesn't feel right, and it's, it's hard enough to live the way that things are without also having the list of things that I'm supposed to be doing and feeling like I'm failing at, at something else. Wow. Okay, does that mean all right, so sure, everybody smoke, drink, be sedentary and, and overweight. No, there are going to be consequences. At the same time, I think that for a lot of people, living in the body may be more difficult than for some of their peers, um, particularly for trans people, but, but for some others as well. Um, I would suggest an attitude of go, go the extra mile in terms of communicating welcome, communicating respect and, and openness. It's always useful to post a non-discrimination statement, but I think also sometimes the artwork we choose, you know, it might be nice um, to see a variety of older couples of different kinds with their photos on the walls. That just might send a much, uh, the picture worth a thousand words sort of message uh, that anything I could say uh, would not be as, as profound. And then using community and national resources, I think, um, to go further than we can is, is also very helpful. Um, ask about preferred forms of address or address, as we say. What pronoun would you like me to use? Um, 
I see that your name is different in your record than as we're talking now. Um, you know, has there been a change? What name would you like me to use? Um, I regard language as a description of the individual for all of us, and therefore try to stay with language as an evolving tool, and at the same time use terms that patients prefer. Um, if an older adult hears the word queer and flinches, terrific. He or she has earned the right to do that. Um, if someone says, please refer to me as genderqueer, fine. Um, they're, that they're probably under 40, um, that's fine too. Um, the other thing that I just would say, I think so much of the time that clinical encounters become needlessly complicated and that if a misunderstanding has occurred about pronoun status, preferred name, partner, relationship, and a gaffe has been made, gosh, remain calm, apologize, say, I've made a mistake here, what can I do to make this right, and then move on. I think sometimes um, we get stuck in ways that, that just are, um, not, not needed, so um, be fully present, have a warm and welcoming heart. If a mistake is made, um, it's probably fixable. We're getting towards the end of the homework, but I'm gonna suggest one more assignment, and that is that it may be helpful to review at least one current policy document regarding LGBT health indices and goals. I gave you a whole bunch, and then to apply that to find at least one way to work to improve the care of LGBT patients um, where you work, if you work in healthcare. There are a lot of things that uh, need fixing. I think that the electronic health record is one of them. We're on it. Senior leadership at, at uh, the University of Vermont Medical Center has signed off. Um, it'll get easier, but in the meantime, there are going to be um, some difficulties. And as much as we can do to provide a routine, relaxed response to difficulties in that area and help patients to navigate the, the problems, help our colleagues to navigate the problems, uh, the better things will be. An example of that, I recently saw um, someone for consultation who was quite depressed, needed admission to inpatient psychiatry. And in getting the information, the story emerged that she had actually gone to the emergency department a couple of days before, and that when she was registering, that up came her previous male name and previous photograph from several years ago that looks quite different. This is someone who's in middle adulthood, a trans woman. She looks quite different now than she did three or four years ago. Um, and her name is different. Up it came, and the person doing registration said, you know, gee, I'm, I'm uh, mm, there's a problem here, and you know, are you sure this is your ID, and and so forth, and and that's an entirely reasonable question. You know, possibly she is someone who doesn't have insurance and is attempting to use the insurance card of a family member. That could easily happen. At the same time, this is someone who's depressed, who's considering suicide, who's not at her best, and who shouldn't need to go through a situation like that and be responsible for trying to explain things while standing on one foot, while trying to register to get care that she desperately needs. Um, and so I call attention to these difficulties because I think that as much as we can do to support patients and support each other in dealing with problems that have to do with technology, the better things will be. Um, from time to time, there's information that comes up having to do with gender history, um, transgender anatomy, sexual orientation, partners or relationships that is not expected in a clinical setting. Um, we can remain calm, say, gosh, I guess this isn't up to date. Tell me how it should be um, and go from there. I think there are a number of things that still need to be done nationally at a policy level. Um, we need uniform, fair requirements for what needs to be done to change gender status across the country. In Vermont, it's not that hard. Um, you know, one produces medical documentation, goes to the DMV to get a license, um, so forth. In some states, it's very difficult. That's an, an area that needs to be addressed. Um, insurances need to stop using M or F as an identifier. 
Um, for a long time, it's been used as sort of a check digit because it was considered to be an immutable characteristic, which clearly this is not. Um, people get bills um, when they transition gender and their insurance paperwork has not caught up that um, the insurance will wind up paying in most cases, but it's going to be a hassle for everyone. Um, we need reasonable criteria for transgender surgery eligibility and insurance coverage. Um, and um, in a, and a change in federal policies regarding insurance. In the state of Vermont, it is unlawful for insurance plans to discriminate based on sexual orientation or gender identity, including transgender. Um, however, that applies to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, but it does not apply to people who have coverage through a federal program through a family member, and, and that needs uh, to be changed. Um, nationwide, we need some uniformity and fairness um, in spousal benefits, particularly in federal programs, regardless of, of um, sex and gender, and also more robust employment protections, uh, particularly at a federal level, um, because of things like the married on Sunday, fired on Monday phenomenon um, that need to be addressed. So bottom line, we've come a really long way. Um, I'm grateful for that. It's one of the good things about being old is that there is enough stuff in the rearview mirror to say this is better. Um, and at the same time, I think that there is more to go and that there are some steps that we can take to try to bring about additional progress and really full equality, both on a one-to-one -one level in clinical care and also on a more macro level having to do uh, with policy and planning. Um, we're not going to go through the resources, but I gave you a number of them. Um, professional associations that have good policies um, regarding LGBT inclusion, non-discrimination, things of that time of that type. If we went back 20 years, it would be pretty much nobody. Now it's pretty much everybody that has to do with with health policy. Um, some of the resources that we talked about in terms of surveys and analyses, I gave you those, um, as well as uh, a few books, including <coughs> mine, um, and um, uh, some uh, organizations that may be useful um, to patients and colleagues. Um, and that's all I got. So there's time to talk, and thanks for listening. That was a whirlwind tour. Questions, comments? I didn't bring snacks. Snacks are outside. Oh. Well, I didn't bring them, but somebody did. That's good. <laughs> hey, Dot. So uh, I want to express appreciation for you, Dr. Eiler, and also for the Imbasiani, uh, I forgot the partner's name, Imbasiani. DeSalvo. DeSalvo. DeSalvo lecture series. I think it's fabulous. Um, and I, I wanted to ask if you could comment on, uh, or, or if you were, were aware of the uh, New York Times editorial board um, piece that came out today with under the headline, no reason to exclude transgender medical care. Had you, were you aware of that yet? And what you thought about it? Uh, today I saw some patients and hid in my office and made sure my slides were loaded. Um, so <laughs> if you would like to enlighten us all, um, uh, I did I not go I online. Didn't today and uh, from Trans Transgender Legal and Defense and Education Fund and uh, I mean, I'm looking forward to reading it but I just I thought it was great uh, for that sentiment to come across the New York Times editorial page. I concur and one of the things um, this is a much more Vermonty session than vetoes that was much more national in California last time and one of the things that I will mention is that Vermont has been a part of that sea change in insurance that in some ways that, that we were in um, on the ground floor with that, that you and I and some other people met with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont um, over a period of a couple of years while they were, were reassessing their policy regarding um, coverage for services, medical services related to gender transition. And previously that had been an exclusion as it had been in most plans around the country. And so Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont met with a group of us and did their homework and decided that they would provide coverage. Um, a couple of years later, 
after that, the state law was passed barring discrimination in insurance plans, and I think that that probably would not have happened. One never knows, but I doubt it, without the Blue Cross experience, because this was a major insurer. It covered a lot of people in the state who could say, you know, we did this, and, and it didn't break the bank. You know, that w which would, on, on one hand, um, I can see why that would be a concern. Some of the surgeries are fairly pricey. On the other hand, this is not something everybody's running out to do. You know, if Blue Cross said, you know, do you want sex reassignment surgery? It's free. You know, I, I, I really can't imagine that demand being very elastic somehow. Um, I think it was the same small number of people, um, you know, a, a former U of M employee um, was asked in this meeting, one of those meetings, how many people among the, the faculty and staff are, are waiting for these surgeries? And, and she said three. And there was a sort of a silent moment, and the representative of Blue Cross said, is that an estimate? And she said, no, I know them all. There's three of us. <laughs> I, I, I'm one of them. And so, oh, okay. So, you know, so Blue Cross does it. The bank, you know, they don't go bankrupt. At that point, it's easier because there's no real opposition from the insurers to get a good state law passed. And then you have a whole state and a few other states having the experience that this doesn't break the bank. And then it looks just like discrimination rather than somehow fiscal responsibility. So thank you for bringing that up. I didn't know it was there. Go New York Times editorial. It's all good. Other comments? Yeah. So as uh, UVM is leaving a lot of uh, LGBT health throughout its curriculum, and there's more and more awareness, I assume that there will be more and more intakes that include LGBTQ questions. And as you were talking about, there's a lot of trauma and um, stuff, on, stuff under the surface, especially for older folks. Um, how ready are how ready are professionals to have those conversations with their patients who may or may never have had them yeah. before? You know, this is what I think of as a rubber meets the road problem, and there really is a generational cohort difference in this. Um, a colleague who's an out gay man in the VA system in New York um, was giving a grand rounds and put together a, a panel presentation. You know, the VA system has come a long way in a short period of time from basically saying, go away and don't tell us anything, to saying, we treat gay people, we treat trans people, we don't yet cover surgeries, but we cover a lot of other care. So he put together a, a panel, and one of his guests was an older gay man who was a veteran who'd had a military career, who'd been closeted the whole time, and came to this, this panel. And one of the students said, um, well, so you get all your care here now, and so forth. And he said, well, no, I don't. And the student said, well, not, why not? You know, it, it, I think it's pretty good. And he said, well, um, being out, being in the military, being a veteran, those things don't go together. They haven't gone together, and I, I go to a, a private clinic. And my colleague said that it was another one of those, those moments where the gulf had opened in that the students who were primarily in their mid-20s as a group were having a lot of difficulty understanding why that might be um, when to the panel members who were in their 50s and up, it was just knee jerk. You know, of course you need to be, to be closeted, of course you need to, to not be out. Um, and so I think that this is, this is an area where um, there isn't a lot of preparation, and there isn't a lot of preparation, including among people who otherwise are quite savvy to realize just how deep that fear might go. Um, and I'm not sure what we can do about that other than continue to talk about it, write about it, read about it, support our patients and support our colleagues and ourselves as we go forward. You know, this is something that probably 20 years hence will not be an issue at all, um, but we've, we've got some time to get from here to there. In answer specifically to your question, I don't know of any curricula regarding you know, how specifically to try to bridge that gap. I just know we need to talk about it and keep working on it.
Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> I just know I've encountered issues where in informal intakes, you might have to take off a question of, you know, identity or a question of past uh, sexual violence. And you as the person who's doing that intake are not necessarily ready to handle that conversation with a person you just re-triggered. Like, triggered. Um, so I've, I've encountered this difficulty. Yeah. You know, I think this is also something that, back to the whole practice, 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 you know, that that from time to time things come up that um, really are difficult. And, you know, psychiatry involves a lot of asking people about past traumas and so forth. Um, and the more you do it, the better you get at providing support. Um, but from time to time, there are difficulties and, you know, I think um, the the more people practice, the better it gets. Everybody makes mistakes, me included. And I do have some grave concerns about um, sort of routine data gathering along the lines that, that we've talked about. Yeah. Yes? So similar in the population of, of older adults who are coming out and have had very different experiences than the younger populations who've come out, uh, I think older physicians can have a different experience with acceptance and understanding and general attitudes toward people on the SOGI spectrum. Um, and I'm curious if as, we, as you know, part of the group of young physicians, is there something that we can do or resources that we can direct our older colleagues and attendings toward for helping them to become more educated and to step away from some of the the attitudes of shame and violence that maybe they grew up with too. You know, they heard their whole lives that you know being that way was abnormal and, and other, and yet they're trying to be, you know, often trying to be very culturally competent care providers. Yeah, you know, I I find that when I talk to colleagues, and when I see colleagues in action, and when I reflect on my own practice. Um, I think every generation has its challenge, and I haven't personally found um, students or young physicians to be any better at dealing with LGBT adults than their older colleagues. And in fact, in many cases, they're actually not as skilled because the the generational cohort effects are so huge. You know that um, you know each of us, in our way, is time bound, right? And we we do the best we can to um, you know learn about, think about the concerns of people who are far younger or far older, you know, and, and um, to, to stay educated and, and so forth. But um, from time to time, um, some of the students and young physicians who are the most savvy with regard to concerns of LGBTQ plus asterisk younger people, I hear them dealing with patients who are older, um, and the, the things that are said, I think of as culturally incompetent in a generational sense. That is not something that one would say to someone who's over 50, and there's not an awareness of that. Um, and so I think in many ways um, that we're all in the same boat, although possibly in a different part of the boat, um, you know, in terms of trying to expand knowledge and skill and, and so forth. In terms of specific resources that I would direct specific people to or that I would want to read myself, um, I think it really depends on the needs of the individual. And I tried to provide some sort of broad-based kinds of things, but there's a lot of other material there. And if you find something that you personally find particularly helpful or that a friend or colleague did, send me an email, and I'll be glad to, to stick it in because, you know, we can always use more sources of good information. Yeah, Rick. Uh, we've run over quite a bit. Oh, have we? Yeah. Oops. And we've got food out there. We don't want to go bad. <laughs> I'm going to get them out to a little later, so. So, so, as, they, as they say when the bar is closing, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Um, so, so thanks very much.